that he's pointed out. Amen. That's his love. Amen. And that's why the Bible says something like this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and for reproof and for correction and instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect thoroughly furnished unto all good works because not only is he going to point out your faults but through the word he's going to show you how to correct them and how to stand upright before him Amen. so he's got to show us our fault watch this that's, that's actually what the word conviction means to convict it means to show or to cause to see and that's why we have the Holy Spirit to convict us to show us our fault. Because watch this. One of the effects of marginal Christianity is that we lose sensitivity to our condition and we forget what we really look like. Amen. I'll say it one more time. One of the effects of marginal Christianity is that we lose sensitivity to our condition and we forget what we really look like. Where did you get that from out of the text? Well, notice what he said. You say that you're rich. You say that you're well off. You say that you're doing okay. But look what Jesus says. But this is what you don't know. In other words, you are deceived. You, you don't see this. So because you don't see this, I have to show it to you. And guess what? There's some of us who we think we're cool with God. We think we're okay because I'm not as bad as the next person. I'm not doing what other people have done. And, and I've got a respect for Jesus. No, Pastor, I ain't been to church in a while. But I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And, and we think that believing that and having confessed that, that just, that's just enough. But Jesus is saying, look, if I'm not worth you completely, laying everything down and living for me, I am not worth anything at all. Amen. That's why he says he's a big pot of coke because if he's not worth you giving him everything, he's really not worth you giving him anything. Amen. Amen. He's either Lord or he's not. He's either worth our whole life and our whole passion and our whole focus or he's not. And I used this example last week. Nobody wants to be in a relationship with a person that they tell you, you know what, I really like you, I'm really into you, but I want to keep my options open. <laughs> How long are you going to be in that relationship? <laughs> Can we work out a schedule that I see you on certain days and then I go do my thing on other days? That's not the ideal relationship, right? But we think that works with God. You know, we show up on Sunday, maybe on Wednesday, or every now and again when church crosses our mind, or Christmas, Mother's Day, Easter, those kind of things. And, and then the rest of the time we do our thing, or, or even all of those of us who show up every week, but then Monday through Saturday, we're living our own passions and living our own desires. We are fooling ourselves, making ourselves think we're okay with God. When God is telling us in His Word, you are not okay with me. Amen. I have to show you your fault because your marginal uh, behavior and mindset has fooled you into thinking you look like something that you really don't. This is what he says. Watch this. The marginal Christian is not aware of these five things. Number one, you are wretched. Let me hear you say wretched. Wretched. Now don't get mad at me. I didn't say it. God said it. <laughs> When you are not burning on fire with passion for the Lord and living for Him every day, no matter how, what your house looks like, how much money you got in the bank, what you dress like, no matter what your friends say about you, God says you're wretched. Let me break that down. What does He mean wretched? When you look at the Greek word for it, it means that you're constantly going through trouble, toil, and affliction. Constantly having to endure trouble, toil, and affliction. Well, Pastor, I would have to deal with that anyway if I wasn't on fire for the Lord, wouldn't I? Yeah, but here's the difference. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, <laughs> but the Lord does what? He delivers them out of them all. The difference between them and us is, yeah, we go through affliction, but we get delivered out of them. Amen. Those who are not on fire for God, who are not passionate about God, they go through the affliction and it never ends. That's what makes them wretched. They have to constantly endure pain and trouble and toil. That's why people who are not uh, uh, passionate about God, they'll often make statements like this. If it's not one thing, it's, it's always something. <laughs> and you never get delivered from the toil. You're always constantly spinning your wheels. There is no rest for the weary because you are wretched. Amen. 
wretched. Yeah. If that's not enough, he goes on to say that now wretched is bad enough when you think. But he lists four more things. The second thing he says is these people who are not passionate about God, they are miserable. Miserable. And what he means by miserable is these people should be pitied. Have you ever seen somebody in a certain state or a situation where you look at them and just say, I feel sorry for them? That's what God says this person is like. The person who is not on fire for him, that's not passionate for him and serving him and keeping that zeal. God says that person should be looked on with pity that he feels sorry for. Miserable. And sometimes, not all the time, don't, 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 don't make this a across the board rule, but many times some of the most miserable people are the people in the human uh, stratosphere in the human arena or where, realm that we would actually think they got it going on. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones with the nice houses, with the nice cars, they dress good, they eat good, you know, they go on vacation two and three times a year. We, from a human standpoint, would think they got it going on, but sometimes those are the most miserable people. Why do you say that? If the fact that they're miserable, they have to feel their life with all of this other stuff to try to hide the misery that's really going on inside of them. Amen. And that's why it's dangerous to try to fill your life with anything but Jesus. Amen. But can I tell you something? You can have all the stuff and not have fulfillment or joy in Him, but can I tell you something? If you have Jesus, no matter what you have material-wise, you will always have joy. You will always have peace. You will always have fulfillment. You can sleep in a cardboard box on the side of the road. If you got Jesus, it'll feel like a penthouse suite up in there. <laughs> because with Jesus, you're always full of joy and peace. Not only does he say you're wretched, miserable, but then he says you're poor. You're poor. Completely destitute is really interesting that there's two different words that are mainly used for the word poor in the New Testament. One of them is to tokos, and the other one is penates. Tokos and penates. It's two different words. Why do you need to have this, this understanding? Because if you're going to get a good appreciation for what he means by poor, you got to understand the word that he meant and what it meant. Or it says, the, the word penates, P-E-N-E-S, it means poor, but it's a person who has enough strength to work every day for a living. So it paints the picture of a day worker. This is the person that goes down to labor ready. They don't have a any money in the bank, they don't have any reserve, they just work from day to day, they go, they show up, they work, they get paid, they can buy some food, but they got to do that tomorrow, they got to do it the next day, they're toiling every day for what they have, so they're poor, but they can work and get something. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, that's penates. The other word uh, is the, to uh, the tokos, and this word tokos it doesn't mean, it means poor, but it doesn't mean you can work to get it from day to day. It means utterly destitute. It means not only do you not have nothing, but you don't even have the power to get anything. Poor, completely, utterly destitute. When he says that these marginal Christians are poor, which one do you think he's talking about? Utterly destitute. That's the word he uses there, tokos. Utterly destitute. That means, yeah, you got the job, you got the income, you, you, you making things happen, but in a spiritual realm, you don't understand that you are utterly destitute and you have absolutely no ability to even gain anything for yourself. In God's eyes, you're poor. You really have nothing. But then if that's not enough, he says you're blind. Y'all, do you see how horrible this condition is? Yes. Not only are you wretched, not only are you miserable, not only are you poor, but now you're blind. Can't see. Can't see. Blind. You, you, you have, uh, 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 don't have good vision. And this blind can not only mean physical blindness, but it can mean mental blindness. And so what he's saying is, not only can you not see in the spiritual realm, but you have a mental blindness. You have something that's blocking your ability to properly comprehend and understand and perceive things. You are mentally blind, which means you are constantly being deceived. Amen. Malcolm X said it, duped. Had, bamboozled, run amok. That's what this marginal Christian gets in their life. They're blind. They don't have a clue. 
then if that's not enough, the last one he says, you're naked. I looked at the Greek word, I was looking, you know, to find, make sure I was theologically correct and everything as I was talking about these words. And when I looked at the word naked and looked at the Greek and did the research and all that stuff, you know what the definition of it was? Naked. <laughs> I said, it got, I, I, he said, it don't get no deeper than that. It's just naked. Uh, and, and what it means is you're exposed. You're, you're exposed. In other words, you got to understand that when you're in this predicament, you are not hiding anything from God. You are not fooling anything from God. For, 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 uh, from God, you can't fool him. So you stand exposed before him, if not other people as well. Because can I tell you something? People who are passionate about God, who the Holy Spirit is working in their life, who they have discernment, those people can tell a fake when they see one. Amen. You can lift up your hands, you can shout, you can dance, you can give the tithe and offer and all that stuff. But people with discernment can tell a phony when they see one. Because the Spirit of God is the Spirit of truth and He does not allow us to be deceived. That's why when we're marginal Christians, when we're one foot in and one foot out, when we're lukewarm, he says you're, you're, you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. Completely exposed. You're not fooling God. And most of the time, you're not fooling others. I heard somebody say a long time ago, you can fool some of the people some of the time. But you can't fool all of the people none of the time. <laughs> so if you turn to Jesus, watch this. In a deliberate and determined, passionate pursuit, there are some things he gives you that will counter those five things that we just said. There's three things in particular that Jesus said he gives you that covers all five of those other things. The first thing he says he gives you is he says, you buy of me gold tried in the fire. Well, this gold, he's not literally talking about he's going to make you rich and you're going to have a big bank account. He's talking about works. Uh, that are pure in the eyes of God. Uh, how did you get that? Because remember another place that's mentioned something about gold, and it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where Paul talks about our works. He says some of those works are, are going to be works of gold, some of silver, some of hay, straw, and stubble. So there's different degrees of purity of our work and our behavior and our lifestyle, and some people are going to lose it all when they're judged. The fire is going to consume everything because they're not works of suffering. Substance. So Jesus said, when you buy this gold of me, in other words, your, your mindset and your lifestyle is changing in such a way that your works are no longer lukewarm, but he will give you, notice he's giving you, this is not even something you work out for yourself. He's giving you gold, a nature, a behavior, a lifestyle, works that is pure, that's been tried in the fire, it's the real thing. Amen. He says, buy me gold. Real stuff that's going to stand, that's going to last. That's what he gives you. Why does he give you gold? Because when you get this gold from him, you're no longer wretched, you're no longer miserable, and you're no longer poor. Not only that, but then he says he's going to clothe you with white raiment. Did you see that in the text? Yeah. He's going to clothe you with white raiment. This is a picture of sanctification. He's covering you. He's clothing you. And notice the color of this raiment is white. White is always a symbol of purity, of cleanliness. So what he's saying is, I'm going to take again your wretchedness, your miserableness. I'm going to take your poorness, and I'm going to cover you uh, so that it also hides your nakedness. Remember, he said we were naked, but it's going to cover all of those things. And so when I look at you, I will no longer see the junk. I will no longer see the sin. I will no longer see the wretchedness. Now I see sanctification. He, he, he does a trade, a conversion, if you will, in that he takes our junk and our rags and he clothes us with his stuff. Yeah. White raiment. He sanctifies us. And can I tell you something? You can't sanctify yourself. Yeah. It takes Jesus to sanctify you. That's why when people, when they got sin in their life, they got issues in their life, one of the biggest mistakes that I think people make when they say, when they don't understand, they say, well, I'm trying to get it together. I'm working on it. Can I tell you something? Well, if you keep working on it, guess what? It'll never work. Amen. This is this 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 gospel that Jesus has given us, this word Jesus has given us, this is not a self-help program. 
You either submit to him and let him sanctify you or there's no sanctification at all. Then not only that, the last thing he says he'll give you when you turn to him is he'll give you salve for your eyes so that you can see. It, there's a, this is a medicinal uh, type of phrase that he's saying that I'm going to put some medicine on your eyes so that you can see. Because remember, part of the problem with this person who is in the middle, who's not all out for God, but they still kind of in the world and, and want to be in Christ. And they, 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 this person that's lukewarm, then remember, part of the problem is that they're blind. So Jesus said, when you turn to me, I'm going to give you salve for your eyes so you can see. Amen. And one of the things that, that, that marginal people can't see or that they're unaware of is the fact that Christ is standing at the door knocking. Amen. Remember, we've been studying on Wednesday night, literary context. We've been studying these things about good Bible study, and we want to... We want to follow the author's flow of thought. We want to follow his, 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 his penmanship. And we want to see what it is that Jesus is trying to say through this author. And watch this. When, when, when he says they're blind and all those other things, one of the things that's obvious that they can't see is that he's standing at the door knocking. How do you know that they can't see that? Because look at your Bible and I want you to see the word that's right before I stand at the door and I knock. What's the word? Behold! Do you see that in the text? Whenever you see the word behold, it means to stop, look, listen, look, pay attention. So one of the things that these marginal people cannot see is that people, that Jesus is standing at the door knocking. Now I know that doesn't make much sense yet, but watch this, follow me, flow with me on this one. Because if he's standing at the door knocking, that means that he's not on the inside. He's on the outside. Amen. But the marginal Christian, the lukewarm Christian will say, me and Jesus is cool, I respect you. I know Jesus is in my life. I know Jesus is in my heart. That, that's what they have themselves fooled as to thinking. That they're walking with Jesus, that Jesus is with them. That's what they tell themselves. But what the scripture said is this person does not see he's actually not on the inside. He's on the outside trying to get in. <laughs> he said, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. So the first thing you can't see is he's on the outside. The second thing that I don't think people realize is that it's harder to hear a person's voice with them talking from your porch rather than your dinner table. It's harder to hear somebody and understand them when they're on the porch talking to you as opposed to sitting at the dinner table with you. You know why you use the dinner table? Because that's what Jesus says is going to happen if you open up the door. He'll come in and he'll what? Sup with you. He's going to have dinner with you. It's going to be an intimate night. See, you, you may eat breakfast on the run. You may eat lunch on the run. But most people, when it comes to dinner, they don't think of dinner on the run. Matter of fact, dinner was the chief meal of the day for Jews. And so when he says he's going to come in and sup with you, he's not in a rush. He's coming to have intimate fellowship with you. He's going to sit down and spend time with you. He's going to have intimacy, intimate conversation. Well, watch this. It's easy to hear you and understand you when you're sitting at the table with me rather than trying to hear you through the front door. How does that relate in my life, Pastor? Well, here's the thing. Who's the person? I don't need to see your hand. It's just for introspective thought. But, but who's the person who you said, I'm having trouble really hearing what the Lord wants me to do? Pastor, you tell us to pray, but I pray, but I don't ever hear his voice. I don't ever hear him talking to me. I'm not really sure what the Lord wants of me. When, when you're that person, you may want to ask yourself, is there evidence in your life that you're lukewarm? <laughs> because people who walk with Jesus daily and regularly, they don't have trouble hearing him. Amen. I'm going to say that one more again. People who walk with Jesus regularly don't have trouble hearing him. Amen. Let me tell you two reasons why I know that. One, it would be unjust of God to expect you to follow him and then he intentionally muffles his voice so you can't understand. That's not a good God. That's a cruel God. So if God 
want you to follow him. If he wants you to do what's right, then he, he wants you to hear him and know him and hear him speak to you. The other thing is scripture plainly says it. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. When you walk with Jesus regularly, you don't have trouble hearing him. Now, now hear me. I'm not saying that every time he wants you to do something, it's going to be easy. Because sometimes we do have to seek his face. We've got to pray. We've got to fast. we got to do those things to really tune into it. But those things are not because he's making it hard for, for you to hear him. But we do those things so we become more sensitive to him so we can hear him more clearly. It's hard to hear if he's on the outside of the door instead of on the inside. You know, that'll preach all by itself. Amen. I can stay there for another week or so just teaching on that. Because I believe that that's what Jesus is saying to some of us today. You remember that Verizon commercial, Can You Hear Me Now? <laughs> I think that's what Jesus is saying to some of us. Can, can you hear me now? And, and if you can't hear me, it's not because I'm keeping you from hearing me. But there's something in your life, there's something in your heart, there's a blockage that, that is causing you to not hear my voice. God wants you to have fellowship with him. He wants you to enjoy him. He wants you to know him. Yes. Thirdly and lastly, I think one of the things that we're blinded to and why he tells us to behold, I stand at the door and I knock, is because most marginal Christians do not see and understand that he is passionately pursuing you. Yeah. That's the reason why he wants us to passionately pursue him, because he's passionately pursuing you. Notice what he says, and I wish I had time to go into all the Greek, but the way that is is, is said in the Greek. It, it, when he says, I stand at the door and knock, it, he, he's not saying, I came and knocked on your door and you didn't answer, so I went away. He's saying, guess what? I'm still standing at the door. I'm still knocking. And you've been in there doing your thing. You've been living your life. You've been, you've been doing everything you want to do. But guess what? I have not given up on you. I'm not going away yet. I'm here still standing at the door and knocking. You may ignore me for some time, but you will not be able to say, I wasn't persistent. I'm standing at the door knocking. Touch your neighbor and tell him he's passionately pursuing you. I'm so glad we serve a Savior that when you didn't answer the first time, he leaves a card in the door and goes away. <laughs> Amen. This Savior that tells us to seek and you shall find, ask and it shall be given, knock and the door shall be opened. He is now saying, I'm standing at the door. I'm knocking. I wonder if the same thing that works for you will work for me. All right. All right. I told you if you knock, it'll be open. The question is, if I knock, will it be open? Amen. If I seek, will I find it? If I ask, will you give it to me? Yes. He's there passionately pursuing you. He wants you. I'll say it again. He wants you. Amen. To such a degree, he's at the door. He's not going anywhere. But there is a time coming where he won't be at the door. Amen. Knocking. That's why the Bible says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Because that's, right. that's where he is now. But do you really want to leave him out there that long? Do you, do you really want to go another day? Do you really want to go another week? Say, I'm going I'm to I'm get there. I'm going I'm to change. I'm a, do you really want to leave him out there knocking for another moment? We're not talking about your crazy cousin you didn't want to see anyway. <laughs> We're not talking about somebody who gets on your nerves. We're talking about the amen. We're talking about the faithful and the true witness. We're talking about the beginning and the ruler of God's creation. is standing at your door knocking. How long are you going to leave him? Amen. So when we start to understand this, according to the text, our response is to be zealous. Somebody say zealous. Yes. Yes. To be zealous and repent. Zealous means to burn with zeal, to be eager, to exert oneself, to strive after. I'll say it again. Zealous means to burn with zeal, to be eager, to exert oneself, to strive after. What are we to be zealous about? The Bible says be zealous and repent. We're to be eager. We're to 
strive after. We're to exert ourselves in a manner of repentance. Now, let me talk about this repentance real quick. So some of you, I believe you'll be blessed by it. You'll grow by this if you apply it. Repentance comes from a word that means to change one's thinking. Amen. To change one's thinking. To, to reconsider. So what the Lord is asking you to do as you sit here and even hear this loudmouth preacher today, he's saying, will you reconsider the fact that me and you are not as close as you think we are? Amen. Will you reconsider the fact that you've had passion, you've had zeal, you exerted yourself in so many areas of your life, but you're yet to do that for me the way I want you to do? Will you reconsider? Will you change your thinking and realize that in many of your aspects of your life, you lived for yourself and not for me. The job you wanted or the job you took, that was about you. Where you lived at, that was about you. When, when the, the church you chose to go to, that was about you. It, I'm, I'm not saying this is everybody. I just want us to look at ourselves. But he's saying those things may have been about you. Will you reconsider now that your life was really meant to be about me, my purposes, and my kingdom expect? And when you surrender to him, you go where he wants you to go. You do what he wants you to do because there were works that were prepared for you before the foundation of the world that he wants you to carry out. Amen. When we talk about this repentance, I want you to understand this repentance is not just having your emotions stirred. Amen. This is not about you sitting in church and saying, oh, that really touched me. I feel bad. I know I need to give the Lord more of my time. And I need... No, that's not what it's about. God is not after you being emotional. Amen. And, and that's why somebody asked a question a few weeks ago um, uh, when we were doing a study to ask why I don't give invitations a lot. Why I don't you know, do invitations and altar calls and stuff like that. And that's part of the reason why. Because many times when people respond to altar calls, uh, when they respond to invitations, many times it's emotional. Not all of, don't hear me. That's not everybody. That's not all the time. But many times it's emotional. And here's how you know. Because people will come up and say, I want to give my life back to the Lord. I want to be restored. I want to do this and that. And then, you don't see them again. They're they right back to what they were doing before they walked up there. And so what happens is sometimes our emotions get stirred. We feel bad. But guess what? If it's not godly sorrow, it will never lead to repentance. Amen. Sometimes people have worldly sorrow. They regret what they did. They have remorse about what they did. They know what they did is wrong, but they haven't had a change of thinking, which means I can come up front, I can get hands laid on me, and I can be right back in the bed with somebody I ain't married to tonight because my mind didn't change. Amen. Amen. This is not about emotion. This is not about just feeling bad. Does God want you to have sorrow? Yes, but he wants you to have godly sorrow. Amen. Because godly sorrow is what leads to repentance. Amen. God is not moved by our tears if our tears are not connected to a change in our choices. Amen. That we're choosing differently. This repentance doesn't it just refer to particular areas of your life. This repentance refers to your entire life. Amen. So when we talk about repenting, we're not just talking about getting aspects of your life right, but Jesus is saying, I want your whole life. Because can I tell you something? If you determine what parts of your life he can have, then you really are saying to him, you're not Lord, I am. <laughs> him being Lord means I give you control of everything. I live for you. Lastly, this repentance means that because I've had a change in my thinking, I've reconsidered some things, now I reverse that which is out of order. And I don't, I don't look for what's out of order based on my definition of what's out of order, but I go to his word to say, Lord, what do you say is out of order in my life? And as his word starts revealing what's out of order, then I turn those things that are out of order and put them in submission to Jesus Christ. When we talk about passion, it's really about opening up the door to your heart, to your life, to your home, to Jesus. He's standing at the door, knocking, and look at what he says. If you open up the door, I will come in, and I will sup with you, and you with me. He said, we will have intimacy like you have never seen before. You will know me. You will walk with me. You will be able every day to sing that old hymn that says, and he walks with me. 
and he talks with me. Come on and help me, somebody. Amen. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none of it has ever known. That's what Jesus wants for you. Now, now, some of you, let me go here, and then I'm done. I got one more statement, then I'm done. Some of you don't say, Pastor, all right, you've been on this fashion thing uh, for a few weeks, and uh, I'm tired of coming in here getting beat up Sunday after Sunday. Can you preach something that makes us happy and that you know gives us a reason to shout and have joy? And this is what I believe the Lord would say to you. He's going to make you shout when you start living right. Amen. Amen, somebody. Amen. He's going to make you shout. He's going to give you something to shout about when you start living right. So many times we come to church, we're looking for entertainment, not an experience with God. And that's why he says, really, he's showing you how much he loves you. Because those I love, I rebuke, I chastise. And let me tell you something, church. I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching with you. Amen. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Because I'm not going to stand here and pretend like my life is so on fire for the Lord. That may have been why we've been on it for three weeks. He really been dealing with me. <laughs> I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I'm all this passionate and zealous and this stuff I've been preaching. I got it down packed and it's all together. God is not just talking through me. He's talking to me. Amen. He wants all of us to get it together. He wants all of us to go hard after him and to pursue him. And then he said, then you're going to have something to shout about. Amen. Then, then you'll be able to come and, and have sermons that are just encouraging and exhilarating and building you up. But why would he make a shout if we're headed in the wrong direction? showing us how much he loves us and that I'm not going to let you think you're okay. I'm not going to let that fire burn out and you just stale and you're just going through the motions and you're just showing up to church and, and you're just doing what you do. But the zeal is gone. The passion is gone. He said, I want you to get that back. And if you've never had it before, I want you to get it for the first time. I, I want you to know what passionate relationship with Jesus is all about. And as I bring this thing to a close, this is how I want to close. And you can't shout about this. You can have victory. Amen. Amen. <laughs> now, now that's what you can touch three people and tell them. Touch three people and tell them you can have victory. Amen. You can have victory. Amen. That's why I'm so glad that though my plight may be messed up, though my life right now may be jacked up, I can have victory. Amen. Why can I have victory? Because Christ was victorious. Amen. because he overcame. That's what Revelation 3 and that passage ends with. He says that to those that are victorious, I will grant you to sit on the throne with me just like I was victorious and I sat down on the throne with my father. Amen. This is the word to the church today. Stop being a victim and start being a victor. Amen. Help me, Holy Spirit. What are you saying, Pastor? Stop complaining about what mama did to you and they never taught me to love Jesus and, and I never excuses and repent be zealous turn to me because you can have the victory yeah. you don't have to stay where you are yeah. you don't have to stay like you are but he will give you the power to rise above complacency he'll give you the power to rise above mediocrity yeah. he'll give you the power to get up off of that bed of your circumstance and what used to have you held down you'll be carrying in with the power of Jesus Christ yeah. That's the power that's available to you. The same power that raised Jesus from, from the, the dead, dead can raise you from the dead. Amen. Let me say it again because somebody may have missed it. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead can raise you from the dead. Amen. Somebody is sitting here today and your passion is dead. Your zeal is dead. Your fervor is dead. Your desire is dead. And God is saying to you, if I raised up Jesus, I can raise you up. Amen. You can have the victory. Now, that was a word for everybody. You can have the victory. Somebody said that was for everybody. That was for everybody. You can have the victory. There may be a smaller crowd that this word is for. You will have the victory. All right, see, that's why I said it was a smaller crowd, because some folk don't believe it. And so since you don't believe it, you won't act on it. Now, the word for everybody is you can have the victory. For those that will believe it, receive it, you will. Amen. All right, if you're in that second crowd, give somebody a high five and tell them, I will have the victory. I will. I will have the victory. I will. See, I can have the victory is potential. I will have the victory is determination. Amen. I can have the victory as and, and is ambiguous. I will have the victory is very clear and is deliberate. You need to understand, if you open up the door to Jesus, if you come out of your complacency and 
and your marginalism. If you come out of that and just open up the door to your heart, surrender it to him, not only can 